Hey everyone, Ernie Tech here. I was visiting a friend of mine over the weekend and he had said that if I didn't touch on Multics, I wasn't doing anybody any favors with this channel. I said, okay, I agree. However, like everything in this fun world that we like to dabble in, you uh, can go down rabbit holes and never come out the other side. And that's what my fear is, is that I spread myself too thin because there are so many shiny objects to play with. However, Multics is significant because it is, in my estimation, let me know if you think I'm wrong, it is the root, it is the inspiration beginning, the underlying uh, whatever of, uh, of how Unix emerged. So uh, yeah, from that standpoint, it is, um, it is significant. So what I found on the interwebs is a, is a site, it is a repository of knowledge that certainly rivals, if not exceeds, BitSavers. And I'll put a link to it in the description below. But I could spend days digging through this website. And one of the things they have is a great source of history. BitSavers has a great source of history. So does archive.org. This, this really was great because it also gave me a lot of the marketing materials and business materials that these companies had um, had generated back in the day to justify their business actions. And this is an interesting one. These are little snippets from it. It was a uh, presentation to the executive office of General Electric back in June of 64. And what it was doing was responding to market changes. And I think from what I gathered, the big fear was the announcement of the System 360 from IBM, hence the, uh, the frightened salesman. And it was simply an acknowledgement that IBM had um, kind of taken the market, at least in regards to its, its offerings. Now, General Electric considered these companies their main competitors. Sperry Rand, which I think became Burroughs, became Unisys, and so on, controlled data, RCA, Burroughs, which really Sperry Rand and Burroughs merged, NCR, um, General Electric thought that if they could find a way to penetrate and capitalize on a particular market, and that market, I believe, was going to be universities, academic, and things that were not as transactional as the systems that IBM were looking towards, that they could move to be number two. Now, that's pretty funny. They didn't expect to be number one in the market. They were going to be the second. I don't know who the number one is, I guess, IBM, but it was a different market. They believe that the trend was away from traditional methods of batch processing. Now, traditional methods of batch processing, not necessarily away from batch processing. I believe there was still a version of HASP or something running here. But they were just anticipating this fork in the road, and they wanted to be on the proper side of the road. Reality-based is that there were lots of forks in the room. This was the order picture. This is what they believed they budgeted for back in the day. Didn't quite work out that way. Nothing ever does, I guess. But IBM still holds on for dear life, as does um, some other players. And we'll talk about that in a quick second here. All right. The big, the big comparison was um, IBM to the GE645 system, which was designed specifically for Multics. And Multics, if you're not aware, and I wasn't really aware, was a collaboration between um, MIT, GE, and Bell Labs. And it really is the, it is the father, the mother, the, the, the instigation for what eventually we love as Linux. But um, IBM and this system really were in different places as far as their operating system and the way their systems were designed. Now, I find this interesting, DMA interrupt for the I.O. system for this particular machine series, because DMA interrupts were really the way in which you got the attention of your PC back in the 80s. Maybe you still do, it's just hidden in the background, where the channel I.O. was more or less how IBM um, put all their pieces, parts together. So let me know what you think about that. This is what I noticed right off the bat. The target market market for General Electric was research in universities, but that could not be enough to, to hold up the business side. They also believed that they had um, certain companies, uh, AT&T, as they were growing into, and their AT&T long lines, 
Because they had, uh, I don't think they had an association with Bell at the time, but AT&T was the long lines, and Bell was, you know, what you got, where Grandma got her phone from, IBM Industry and Commerce. I don't necessarily agree with this. I think it was wider than just that, and narrower, well, and wider than both this. These overlap big time, but General Electric took a different path than IBM, and, well, the rest is history. What were the things they were offering? Well, this is the description. If you make a comparison to the IBM offerings, um, as far as capability and power, I'm not sure you can really make a direct comparison because they work differently. Um, but this is what you would get for your for your dollars. Uh, channels for voice grade communication lines, something called DataNet, GE115. Again, your comments to me in this channel are phenomenal, and I put these out there as the noob that I am, as the, the naive guy walking through the woods, and I depend on you guys to, to come and rescue me. So let me know what you think of this particular breakdown of what the early GE645 systems consisted of. And GE, of course, created its own peripherals, one of the things I couldn't get a handle on was model number methodology. IBM had methodology in their model numbers. Some of these things were just not, they weren't marketing savvy. I don't think that is the problem with IBM, but General Electric, I don't believe, had the marketing savvy to understand how to market these things so that it had a consistency that stuck with, that stuck with maybe the client, but that stuck with the salesmen and system engineers and so on. So this is what it looks like. I didn't put in model numbers because as far as I could tell, they were all over the place. But they had an entire line of hardware that went along with it. So standard stuff. But this is where it got interesting. Back in the 60s, as they were developing this Multix environment with the GE645 and later, they lost Bell Labs in 70, um, and then there was sort of a takeover here. You know, 70 and 69, well, yeah, this is, should be the other way around, but it was a sort of a, a merger began to uh, um, happen here. So I guess in the 60s, maybe into 1970, 69 to 70, Bell jumps out, Honeywell takes over GE's computer division. GE says, ah, we're not going to be in the business anymore. Too much, too much for us. And then later on, a French group called Group Bull takes over Honeywell's computer division, and it still exists. Now, I don't believe they're running Multics, but I believe that maybe there's a derivative. There was for quite some time. But Group Bull still offers hardware, and that is the uh, ascendant, descendant, the descendant of all this history, starting back in the day with MIT Bell Labs and General Electric, up through Honeywell and up into Bull. Whether or not I get into this, I don't know. I'm going to think about it, but anyhow, for now, this is the history of where it went. Okay, the simulator. So there is an open source simulator right down here from this address, and it runs in a uh, command environment on your PC or your Linux box or whatever. There's no GUI per se. And you attach to it the same way you do with anything else. You have a 3270 terminal and you just dive into the thing, but you have to get the thing to run. And fortunately, there's another location. Again, all these things I'll have in the description. It has a fully configured warm boot environment that all you have to do is just tell the emulator or simulator what you want. And it will take that INI file and it will generate an environment that matches. So you don't have to do a whole lot. It's already up and running. And we're going to actually try this and, uh, and see how it goes. All right, a few things. I'll have more in the description. But that's generally how I interpret what I'm going to be playing around with here. And that is the lineage of General Electric up through time, getting into Honeywell, finally into Group Ball. And some of the business ideas and business thoughts that were occurring to General Electric back in the day. I don't think a lot of it panned out. Some of it did. But ultimately, Group Bull still has um, their product line. It also reminds me of how Sperry Rand 
moved into uh, finally becoming a Unisys. You know, Sperry Ram, Burroughs merging, uh, Univac, Unisys. So yeah, the mainframe environment, mainframe manufacturing environment is rich with history, and that's a lot of fun to delve into. All right, let us play with the uh, simulator. So in the description below, there are two sites, one to download the DPS-8M emulator, simulator, emulator, whatever, and the other to uh, download the actual Multics operating system. I think it's 12, 12.8. And all it does is unpack into one little directory. Of course, you can be creative, but this is what I do. I just put it into a, root, a directory off the root of C for my Windows system. And you run everything just from the command prompt. There's no GUI or anything. But let me tell you about what happens when you unload all of this stuff from these two files. One is the simulator itself, and the other is the operating system, the disks, and so on. Is This is all you have. All you have here is just this, um, and it's extremely simple to utilize. Unlike uh, Hercules, which is not, a, not difficult, unless you want it to be, but uh, in this case here, everything is right off the root, and it's easy as get out to run. So all I did was create a little um, file to get it running, a little bat file. But I did that already. It's too long of a process to get it running to, to do it interactively here. So let me just show you what it looks like. All right, once I have it up and running, and it's so easy, it's just not worth it for me to walk you through the steps, like two steps. But the instructions are very clear on the website. All right, let me close this down here. So the simulator is up and running right here. So here is the top, and it says, all right, um, go down to the bottom. This is what it looks like when it, when it loads up. So it's the, the, one of the iterations is running. I had shut it down a couple times. But that's what it looks like. You would see all these things go by various steps as it goes through. And once it gets to a point where it reaches just about there, uh, believe me, these things are not very interactive. They don't tell you an awful lot. I guess you don't really need to. Then you open up a session into the, um, into the server. Now, what you're doing is you're just pressing enter, and it will load the first port that's available, which in this case is the first port because nobody else is using it but me. And there you are right there. That's all it says. That's all there is to it. So when you want to load into, like, into this thing, you put in um, the name. Now, the name, the login person is repair. Funny. And then a password that I created. And that's all there is to it. Now you're into the system. And it is extremely powerful, but it, like everything else, it does not hold your hand. You, not, you have to know what you're doing with it. Now, I, I mention this all the time. Use the help. Go into help right off the bat. But if you're on a Linux system, if you're on a Unix system, and you just type in help, for the most part, I don't know if some of the distros are more uh, in the, uh, advanced than this, but for the most part, it's like the man pages. You, you should know what you're asking about. So if I typed in um, help list, it's going to give me something very similar to uh, the man type pages that you would see in Unix. So I I know that this is the root. This is the uh, the beginning of the Unix philosophy. Now, obviously, it's not Unix, but it is the philosophy versus the data set orientation that you're going to find with MVS or uh, you know, an IBM type operating system. Now, the fun thing is, is that MTS and Music SP, to me anyway, feel like hybrids of the two forks in the road. The Unix fork that apparently, you know, eventually became the primary, and then the other fork, which was the uh, the MVS Z OS environment. I'm not talking about uh, the VM for Linux or anything. I'm talking about the two forks in the road. So that's kind of how it works. There's not a whole lot more to it, except, of course, there's tons of commands, things that uh, you need to learn. I don't personally have the time right now to get into into this. Maybe I will in the future, but I've got so many other things to um, to work through. I got to. I really have to spend time on VM three seventy and CMS, 
and get back to my uh, my love affair with music SP. And then I found another uh, couple sources of things I want to you know chase rabbits down the hole. But I just wanted to show you that there he is out there, and the links are in the description. A very nifty, um, fully functional um, Multic system that you can um, get up and running on your on your on your computer, and you can have your way with. So. All right, that's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to give Multics a little bit of do. Uh, the, the shallow dive, as it were, and I'm going to go back to my coffee in my mucky, uh, muckies, yeah, into my buckies. I need more coffee to pronounce buckies. Holy mackerel, into my buckies mug. All right, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Thanks uh, for all the wonderful comments. You guys are fantastic. And I will, uh, I'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.